afternoon, everyone. This is Diane Fodell. Thank you for joining the Cognitive Systems Institute speaker series call. Um, today I'm happy to introduce Dr. Brian Nelson, who's an associate professor of education technology with a joint appointment in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College and the School of Computing, Informatics, and Decision Systems Engineering at Arizona State University. Dr. Nelson's research focuses on the theory, design, and implementation of computer-based learning environments. Dr. Nelson was the project designer on the River City Virtual World Project through two National Science Foundation funded studies and co-principal investigator on the NSF funded Ask Dr. Discovery, Save Science, and Surge studies. Each of these studies explores the use of computer games to teach and assess science inquiry and content. Brian has been at ASU um, since earning his doctorate in education from Harvard University, and today Brian's going to present Design for Learning and Assessment in Virtual Worlds. Welcome, Brian, and thanks for being our presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us this morning. Uh, in looking at my slides, I've got uh, way more material in the slides than I have time to cover, so I'm going to focus in on just one part of it, but there's other fascinating stuff in the slides uh, there for you if you want to take a look afterward. So I do, uh, I'm an education researcher and, and uh, uh, as was mentioned in that nice intro, I, I look at how we can design educational games in virtual worlds to help kids learn science. And I've got a particular focus on virtual world-based uh, design. And uh, in looking at virtual worlds, it's kind of an odd space to think about as a, as a location for kids to be learning, but it really makes a lot of sense if we think about learning as being uh, situated, as learning being best when it's contextualized to scenarios, to performances uh, that look and feel sort of like the real world. And so if we want to give kids an opportunity to practice scientific inquiry, uh, rather than having them sit in a classroom and listen to their teacher list off the steps of conducting inquiry, we can put them into an adventure in a realistic looking world in which they need to use skills of inquiry and uh, content knowledge as well in science to solve problems. And the hope is then that through that more realistic situated uh, approach to learning, they'll be able to transfer those skills out into the real world. So that's that's sort of why I'm looking at virtual worlds. Also, if you look at what happens in a kid's life outside of school, pretty much every moment anymore is spent on some sort of digital device and interacting with different forms of social and collaborative media. But it's still the case that that tends to go away when the kids walk into the classroom. And in fact, many schools go out of their way to eliminate all of the technology that the kids have outside of school rather than making use of the culture of those kids that they're accustomed to in three quarters of their day uh, to help them learn. So virtual worlds have some features and functionality that match with what kids are doing already, and so I'd like to see how we can make use of those. Now, I've been doing research around educational virtual worlds for 15 years now, and, and over that time, what I've discovered is that uh, designing educational virtual worlds is a, a little bit complicated, mostly because the promise of virtual worlds is that they are really powerful platforms for learning because they're highly realistic, or they can be, and that you can situate learning. And those virtual worlds can support so-called 21st century skills, skills like problem solving and uh, collaboration. And they can also support innovative ways of thinking. They can support the idea that there isn't a single way of approaching a given problem. There are multiple paths towards solutions. With each of these areas, those are sort of the areas of promise. But there are challenges in each of those areas. Even though virtual worlds can be good for learning, they're often not designed very well, especially educational virtual worlds. Even though they can support 21st century skills, uh, in terms of trying to understand what students learn in those virtual worlds, we tend to assess them through pretty traditional old school means, meaning like multiple choice tests. And even though they can support innovative ways of thinking, 
policy issues, uh, particularly around school curriculum, often result in curriculum going into virtual worlds that lead students towards very simple, uh, homogenous answers. So this is a lot of material. What I'm going to focus on today is the first one of these this first issue that often educational virtual worlds are not very well designed. In my research, I've been looking at theory-based approaches to help bolster the odds that a kid experiencing some sort of science curriculum in a virtual world is likely to actually learn something. So I'm an education researcher. I work with education researchers. Through a series of NSF and MacArthur grants, I've been working with education theorists and curriculum design people, and they tend to focus when they're thinking about virtual worlds on the curricular and pedagogical issues. It makes sense. They tend to spend less attention focusing on the design of the experience that students have in the virtual world and how that design may help or hinder the way kids learn inside that space. So let me give an example. Virtual worlds are super complex. That's supposed to be one of the benefits because they, that complexity allows uh, for a realistic learning experience. However, that same complexity may cause real issues for students from a cognitive processing perspective in that the virtual worlds themselves may be so complex that it essentially overwhelms the student and the student spends so much effort trying to simply understand what's going on in the virtual world that they're not able to focus in on the learning tasks or the assessment tasks that have been designed into the virtual world. So in projects I've worked on, I've been trying to explore specific design approaches from a, a cognitive processing perspective, in my case, to see whether those approaches might help benefit students. So let me give an example from River City. So River City is a project I worked on for about seven years. It was based out of River City uh, with Chris Aditi as the head and a whole bunch of folks working with me. It's a multiplayer virtual world designed to teach science inquiry and content skills to middle school students. We have about 20,000 students uh, run through River City more, I guess, at this point. Students go through in teams to solve problems about why people are dying inside the River City virtual world through uh, exploration of the virtual world, through interaction with objects in the virtual world, through talking with characters in the virtual world. They can gather up uh, data, they can form hypotheses, and they can actually test their hypotheses in the virtual world. So from a curricular point of view, River City uh, matches the strengths of virtual worlds. It's situated, it's realistic, it matches real world science skills. But the interface and the design of the experience for students in river cities was kind of a mess. Um, if you look at this example of the river city interface, you can see that there is a ton of information being presented to students as they work their way through the river city environment. What we are hoping students will do related to our claim that virtual worlds are powerful learning spaces is to have students focusing most of their attention here in the virtual space and interacting with objects. But we also have lots of other things going on. In River City, there's a text-based chat window through which students can communicate with their teammates to plan out their investigation and through which they talk to uh, NPCs, computer-based characters. There's a display space in which they get additional information about what they're viewing inside the virtual world, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff out and around the edges of this interface. So in conducting research over the years with students in River City, we did find that it was a pretty powerful space for kids to conduct realistic science inquiry, and in particular kids who don't usually do so great in science, they did really well inside River City. But in talking with how they interact with them about how they interacted with the environment, we found that uh, a, a not inconsiderable percentage of the students paid no attention to this information out on the edges of the screen, information that was quite important for them to understand in order to be able to solve the mystery. And so with a PhD student at ASU, we did an analysis of this interface from a cognitive processing perspective, specifically looking at different multimedia principles from Rich Mayer and other Sweller 
and so on, to see if we could make use of some of those principles to redesign this space to help reduce the perception of cognitive load that the kids were feeling so that they were more likely to be able to focus in on the activities that we wanted them to inside the space. So looking at River City, we, we realized in order for the learning to be as powerful as possible, we needed to keep the person, the kid, focused on the 3D environment. And uh, we could do that by eliminating some of the reading that they needed to do. For example, we could have the students interact with characters in, and teammates in the virtual world through speech rather than having to read a bunch of information. We also thought we could make use of visual and audio signaling techniques to help focus their attention. We could apply some spatial contiguity principle design to bring together related pieces of information into the 3D world itself rather than have them scattered around the outer edges. And we thought that we could design for what we called essential complexity, which means we wanted to strike a balance between keeping the virtual world experience relatively complex and realistic, because that's what we think helps bolster immersion and engagement and uh, more powerful learning, while at the same time recognizing that students are making use of River City and other virtual worlds in a classroom setting where they have a limited amount of time and where we need them to focus as much attention as possible on the actual learning activities within the virtual world. So we, we explored that balance. So for example, a, a student of mine, a former PhD student, Ben Erlinson and I, we got a custom version of the River City virtual world and we ran a study around uh, the modality principle, the idea that we might be able to reduce a student's feeling of, of uh, mental effort as they were working with the virtual world by switching from having them read text messages as they went through the virtual world from their teammates to being able to just have a headset on and be able to talk to their teammates as they were working through. And that's also kind of a split attention effect where we wanted to allow them to just be looking at the 3D world, talk to their teammates, and keep their focus in that space. So we ran a study here at ASU in which we randomly divided up teams of students, three or four students were on a team, and some student teams would be communicating with each other through uh, voice, just talking to one another through headsets, and others would continue to use this text-based chat system. And we gave them a, a, a sort of classic self-report cognitive load measure, which we've learned it has some issues, but it, it uh, has been used repeatedly in a number of studies and has been shown to be fairly reliable in terms of measuring a student's perception of cognitive load. And learning as well. We wanted to see if there's any difference in the learning student's experience as they went through, depending on how they talk to one another in uh, the virtual world. So what we found is that uh, there were significantly lower levels of perceived cognitive load for the students who were just speaking to one another as they went through the virtual environment versus those who had to go down to the text chat window and type to one another, which seems pretty obvious, but nobody had looked at this in virtual worlds. And so we uh, were able to find that that was a, a, a very easy change to make to the design of virtual world experiences that seemed to benefit uh, cognitive load at least. On the other hand, there was no difference in terms of the learning that the students experience between these two groups. This is a trend, not just in the virtual world-based design research I've done, but before in looking at sort of the classic cognitive load uh, collection of studies that have been done, that it's often the case that multimedia design principles have worked pretty well to reduce the perception of cognitive load, but not particularly well all the time in terms of bolstering students' learning. In our case, we, we were sort of trying to figure out why there was no difference, and uh, mainly in our case, we ran our study with a convenient sample of university students uh, who were not the target population of safe science, which is middle school students. And so when we gave the students a, a sort of classic pretest, uh, everybody did pretty well on it, so there wasn't a whole lot of room for them to do better. So we had a mismatch between our assessment and our performance, but we did find that uh, changing to a voice modality seemed to help cognitive load. So let me give a couple other more recent examples. I, I just finished up a long, long NSF project, Save Science. We ended up running for seven years 
with colleagues out of uh, University of Maryland and Temple University. And Safe Science is sort of the flip side of River City. River City was a virtual world designed as a learning space for science inquiry, but used traditional assessment measures, pre and post, multiple choice, and short answer question. Safe Science instead had students go into their regular middle school science classroom, study their regular curriculum with their teacher, and then for certain topic areas, weather and climate, uh, force and motion, beginning speciation, uh, and a couple of other ones, they would go into our virtual world and essentially take a test. And we would tell them it was a test. And the test was to go on a situated adventure and solve problems through which they needed to make use of the uh, content and skills that they'd studied in class to solve the problem. Then we analyzed the data coming out of that adventure and could then have predictive models about how well the students had learned the material that they had studied in class. So that was the main focus of Safe Science. For my part, I did a series of studies with PhD students here looking at some of these multimedia principles to see the impact they may have when applied toward virtual world design. Uh, we've done studies so far on visual signaling, on personalization of the avatars that kids control in the virtual world. We did a couple of spatial contiguity studies. Uh, given the short period of time I've got today, I'm going to talk specifically about a visual signaling study that we did. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, virtual worlds can be really powerful for learning. And looking out at the games, educational games literature, um, some of the benefits that are touted related to educational games, particularly virtual world-based games, relates to the fact that students spend lots of time inside these spaces, months of time, interacting with other people and with the virtual world. But when we're going into a classroom with something like Save Science, we're not going in for months at a time. We're going in for 45 minutes at a time. And so in order to run on a virtual world that's a test, we need students to actually be taking the test, meaning they need to interact with the objects in that virtual world that will give us data to help us understand how well they've learned the material they studied in their class. So we need to get those students to be focusing on those, uh, essentially those test questions. So visual signaling, we thought, might be a way to help guide students more directly towards the interactive elements that we needed them to focus on. So here's an example. This is the sheet trouble module in River City, I'm sorry, in Save Science. And uh, we're looking at two different versions that we did in a study I'm going to describe in a moment. Uh, here is the, the non-signaled version of the sheep trouble module. Uh, it's relatively visually complex, not too much going on. And then here is a wildly overtly signaled version of that same environment, very clearly letting students know where they need to go and what they need to interact with next. So the sheep trouble module itself was designed as a, an assessment of beginning speciation and adaptation. So students would study in class uh, like the Galapagos Islands and looking at how animals evolved over time to that specific environment. Then they would come into our sheep trouble virtual world in which there are two flocks of sheep living on a farm. One flock of sheep that lived out on an island out in the sea the sea and has just been brought onto this uh, farm and another flock of sheep that have lived on this farm forever. And the sheep that have just been brought in from uh, outside are, are getting sick, they're losing weight, they're dying. And the students have to try to figure out uh, why that's the case using the knowledge that they've learned in class. So in order to take this test in the virtual world, the main interactive task was to go up to the different sheep and take measurements from the sheep. Students could measure the body length, the ear length, leg length. They could weigh the sheep. They could check the gender of the sheep, uh, the age of the sheep. For all of these pieces of information, students could uh, take notes and they could create graphs through which they can compare different characteristics of these two flocks of sheep to form hypotheses about what they think is going on. 
So we ran a visual signaling study in which we put those big green glowing arrows on uh, uh, the sheep and also on some signs that provided information to the students. And we wanted to know whether the use of the visual signaling technique would, re would reduce a student's perceived extraneous cognitive load when they're in an environment for a short period of time. And also whether we could increase the efficiency of our assessment, meaning could we do a better job of getting students to interact with the sheep? Would they interact with more of the sheep? Basically, would they take more of the test questions to provide us data about their learning? So we ran it with roughly 200 seventh grade students, this study, randomly assigned, this was now an individual assessment rather than a team-based one. So half the students had signaling and half had unsignaled uh, version of this sheep trouble virtual world. Again, we used a self-report measure for cognitive load, and we found that there was a significantly lower level of overall reported cognitive load among students who were in the signaled version of sheep trouble. In terms of efficiency, meaning how often did they interact with the sheep, uh, we saw significantly greater numbers of interaction with sheep among the students who were in the signaled version. So they were actually taking more questions on the test, giving us more data. And then interestingly, there was this weird kind of sticky effect where for the students who were in the signaled version, they interacted with more sheep, meaning they went and clicked on more sheep. But once they clicked on them and opened up that measuring window, they were more likely to stay there and take more measurements, and which is weird because there's nothing signaled inside that measuring uh, portion of the environment. So for us, the implications of that study were pretty clear. Use signaling in virtual worlds, which we've done ever since in every other study that I've been running. And we were curious to know why the signaling seemed to have the sticky effect that caused students to collect more data once they had done the initial uh, selection of the sheep. So this is something we're going to be investigating in upcoming studies. And our environment was relatively low on the complexity level, we thought, for its visuals. And so we wondered whether if we had a really super visually complex virtual world, if that would then uh, result in an even stronger effect on cognitive load uh, if we use signaling on there. So that's roughly the time I have. As I mentioned at the beginning, I've got lots of other parts in here looking at the design specifically of assessments in virtual worlds and, and exploring the kinds of data that we can collect and how we can make sense of that data. So I'll invite you to take a look at that uh, later. But that wraps it up, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brian. Um, audience, please press star one on your phone to ask a question. And I see Scott posted um, some questions. Scott, can you come off mute? Uh, hello, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm. Uh, particularly appreciative of your work in how it focuses uh, students scientifically within a virtual earth, within a virtual world, uh, to raise uh, specific scientific questions. I'm wondering how um, your research or your even planning for uh, subsequent projects in virtual worlds um, might develop around exper actual experimentation. Uh, and this could be, you mentioned hypotheses, for example, a first step in experimentation. Um, th this could be um, uh, in a very sophisticated virtual Earth um, with uh, artificial intelligence that correlated um, actual brain neurons with uh, computational models of brain neurons 10 years out. Are you thinking in terms of experimentation at all? Well, the, the closest I've come to, to doing experimentation is nothing as sophisticated as what you described. But in, in River City, we did, uh, we did then move from students forming hypotheses to having them actually conduct experiments. And in, in our case, what we did is that the students would formulate their hypothesis, and uh, they were able to select from this giant collection of different possible hypotheses that we had built in. So it was sort of canned. But once they had selected that hypothesis, uh, we did a sort of groundhog day, if you know the movie, experiment, where 
they, the students could make specific changes to the way the underlying model of the world was functioning. And based upon those changes, they would then return to the same day in the world and then explore the virtual world to see what changes had or hadn't occurred based on the hypothesis that they had selected. And we actually allowed them to be able to, to uh, sort of teleport back and forth between what was then the control world and their own experimental world to explore those differences. It was really quite rich because depending on the hypothesis, we made lots of changes, or little, depending on how uh, good their hypothesis was. So the, what the characters would say would be different, the way the actual world itself would look would be different, um, and so we've done it in terms of that. So you could certainly take that concept and, and make it more uh, sophisticated. Um, we haven't Great. done it yet, but we could, you know. Thank you. Are there other questions for Brian? Hi, hey Brian. This is Jim Spore. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. And virtual worlds are a great subject. Have, are, um, I, I couldn't quite tell, though, are you building um, intelligent tutoring systems or other things as components as well, or just it's more constructivist and they just do their thing. Yeah, and in, in the work I've done so far, it's primarily been constructivist. I know, I know James Lester has done more towards building in uh, sort of an underlying cognitive tutoring system. And he had, like, uh, he had a virtual world called Crystal Island in which he did some of that work. Yeah. And I've been talking here at ASU with Kurt Van Lane about um, doing research around scientific modeling in virtual worlds that would incorporate more of an underlying intelligent tutoring system. It's, it's an interesting challenge because virtual worlds tend to be these sort of open-ended exploratory environments. Right. And so I'm, I'm personally interested in the idea of within an open-ended constructivist kind of exploration, there are still going to be fairly defined uh, tasks that somebody needs to perform. And it's those sort of underlying tasks that are part of the overall experience that would make a lot of sense to do with intelligent tutoring systems where you could sort of uh, carefully watch what choices are being made. And what's really powerful in a virtual world is based on those choices, you could then alter the world around them uh, to help support them better. Right, right. Yeah, I think a blend of constructivist and having the cognitive tutor could be real interesting for certain things. And I don't know if you've seen the Berkeley MOOC on Intro to Artificial Intelligence. It's an edX MOOC, but it, it, it uses virtual worlds in a pretty interesting way to teach machine learning and a lot of AI techniques. So that might be something to... Oh, yeah, I've not seen that. I'm, I'm writing it down right now. Yeah, this uh, Berkeley edX. Intro AI MOOC should get you it. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions for Brian? Jim, thanks for the question. I, I thought I'd mention um, Phaedra uh, Bonaderis is, is um, she's a, our gaming expert in IBM, Brian, and I. Um, told her about your talk today. She's traveling today, but I'm sure she'll listen to the replay. Okay. Oh, yeah, replay. that's a good, good connection to make for you, Brian, if uh, you're interested in an IBM contact that does serious games, and she's developed some city simulators and other types of, uh, you know, call center type simulators and, and some practical things for teaching some IBM relevant skills. And also, she worked with a, a high school instructor who they developed some cognitive uh, tutoring stuff uh, in um, uh, Minecraft. So for oh, interesting. Okay. Students' constructivist environment. So yeah, that might be a good follow-up uh, pointer as well. Yeah, yeah that would be wonderful if you can send me the contact info. Yeah, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make an email introduction and send you some links to some of our serious games. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for being our presenter today, and thank you, audience, for um, attending. Uh, we will be here next week, same time, and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you, Brian. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.